Happy Sunday. I want to first express my appreciation to Gary Go from the second service for preparing for us the video anthem this morning. He has been doing that. He, he picked a good song, but when he cannot find the video, he will actually put in the words himself. And because I am trained in graphic design, I know that he picked a font specially for this. And I also know that he do a drop shadow on the font. So that takes a lot of uh, a, a bit of a work. So I, I appreciate that. And really, it shows faithfulness in small things. So I, I pray that that kind of spirit will be something that we all understand. That if you get an opportunity to serve the Lord, make sure that you really put in your best and do your best. Now, we have a bit of a problem with the main projector. So you have to look at the two, two screen. And don't forget that uh, for the longest time, people have been preaching without PowerPoint and all that. So you've got to listen carefully uh, to the sermon. This morning, we want to continue with our uh, Old Testament survey on Genesis. And now we reach a, a, another very important chapter in the Old Testament. But uh, on the surface, the chapter looks like a historical account of something that happened only to Abraham. But I assure you that it has everything to do with us today as well. So let's quickly review what was taught the last lesson. I'm so used to looking at this side. Let me go look at this side. Uh, the last lesson we were at Genesis chapter 13, and the uh, parallel verse used was 1 Timothy 5, and we were talking about the separation of Abraham and Lot. And from there, we actually drew the lesson relating to culture and cultural traits and some of the things that we do experience every day in our life. And the background story, remember, was that Lot's father died uh, when he was still very young. And Abraham really treated Lot as if he was his own son and basically enabled him to be quite rich as well. But the problem came where both family, Abraham's family and Lot's family, uh, kept growing and then they had more servants and then there were quarrels between the servants and then they had to split. You know, in Chinese, this is called fenjia, where you actually reach a certain stage where you say that you're going to, you're going to split ways. And what happened is that when we saw that Abraham was really generous, he, he let Lot have the first choice and said, you take whatever you want and I'll take the balance. Whatever you don't want, then I will take. And the thing that was quite shocking was that Lot immediately took a full advantage of what the person who, who is like a father to him uh, did to him and completely went in for the kill, so to speak, and picked really the best land, the most fertile land, and then left Abraham with really quite lousy kind of a land. And so we wanted to learn lessons relating to kinship and cultural traits, especially from the Chinese anger. Now, there are uh, folks worshipping among us who are not Chinese, but generally speaking, Asian culture have a similar kind of a trait. And so because I'm more familiar with Confucianism and the Chinese culture, I, I chose to use that as, as the key focal point of the, the preaching. And we talk about how Confucianism has such a long history, in fact, about 500 years before Jesus Christ even. And it was not just about Confucius, but many of the people who were around him, before him, after him, his disciples, all coming up together. And I remember I, I was talking about how some of the very important teachings of Confucianism includes rites, rituals, uh, correct mannerism, the way you should address each other. Uh, you know, uh, not like the West, uh, everybody's uncle, auntie, but in, the, in Confucianism, it's very serious. Who, what kind of a, a generation you belong to. But among all of the emphasis of Confucianism, filial piety is like the one uh, trait that stands out far apart from all other traits. And so, you know, you are supposed to be brought up to listen to a lot of filial party stories. Remember the 24 stories I told you? Uh, there was this family that wanted to bury the baby just to feed the old grandmother kind of a concept. It's like such a shocking thing. I, I know a lot of you have not heard the story before. So after the sermon, you came to me and said, hey, you know, I've never heard this before. That's because you're not very Chinese. Like, that's a problem. <laughs> but you, you remember that this is so important that Taiwan has it on a postage stamp. Right, they have postage stamp for the 24 filial party story, which means that it's considered positive. Okay, hello, it's considered positive that you should bury that cute little kid, just to make sure that your own mother survive. You know, it's a shocking thing, but it really goes to the extent to demonstrate how deeply entrenched the idea of filial party and kinship and respect for your father, your mother, your uncle, your, even your elder brother or whatever uh, really is in the traditional Asian kind of understanding. Therefore, the idea of Abraham and Lot would give rise to the idea that Christianity is a very strange 
kind of a faith because we allow the Lord to sort of take advantage of his uh, elderly uncle in this particular case. So therefore, there are really a lot of misconceptions about Christianity. The idea that the Christian faith is a Western faith, that it really promotes individualism, doesn't care about your father and mother. Certainly, we wouldn't advise you to go bury your baby to feed your mother, kind of a thing. So to the Asian culture, oftentimes, Christians are told that, you know, you are, your religion really disrespects the, the, the elderly. Uh, and especially in the Chinese circle, right? Because ancestor worship is such an important aspect of many traditional family. So as pastors, sometimes couples come to me for marriage prep course and they en encounter problem. One of the family members would be not Christian or, or something. And then in the wedding rites, then there is ancestor worship involved. And so it gets very complicated because, you know, if... The other party is very, very Christian. They found out that, hey, my daughter-in-law or my son-in-law is going to do this ancestor worship. Then you get serious problem, you know. Uh, I, I won't tell you how to solve this problem. If you want to know how to solve this problem, go and become a pastor and then you, you learn by the hard way. So it's a, it's a very real issue here. So what I wanted to do is to, first of all, really affirm the biblical teaching. The Bible really strongly affirm that honouring our father and mother is the most important thing. Remember, this is the first of the commandments in the Ten Commandments relating to human relationship. So first four of the Ten Commandments relate to our relationship with God. The next six are about our relationship with each other. And the very first of the six will be honour your father and mother. So that is such an important thing. And there are many, many verses in the Bible that tells us that we need to honour those who are elderly among us, those who have been wise, those who have a part to, in our upbringing. And 1 Timothy 5, 1 to 8 was the other passage that was used to, to really highlight the point that the Bible, unlike what other people say, really put a lot of emphasis on the responsibility we should have towards our kin. 1 Timothy 5, 8 especially talk about how if you do not take care of your own family, you are worse than an unbeliever. That's a really harsh words from the Apostle Paul. Having said that then, the question relates to then how do we look at our 24 filial party stories versus uh, our Christian understanding. Our emphasis is that God's truth is supreme over all. Therefore, when cultural traits and cultural teachings affirm God's truth, we must use them as tools because it affirms God's truth and it's fine. But if not, we should discard them. And so that's the really kind of a criteria that should guide our life. So for example, as a father, you look at your child, you shouldn't follow the traditional Chinese saying that I'm the dad, you are the son. Keep quiet and do whatever I tell you. doesn't matter what I say. Because look here, in ancient days, people would bury their children just to obey their mother and father. That doesn't make any biblical sense. So therefore, you shouldn't insist in that kind of thing just because it's part of cultural trait. At the same time, you shouldn't also let your child do whatever he or she wants to you because, you know, we are now in an open society, so it doesn't matter, no discipline either. Let the kid do whatever he or she wants because he's very cute, very creative, or whatever it is. No, you, you, you always apply biblical principle above all other principles in life. So always look at everything else in life in light of the truth of God. And if you do that, you will understand what are tools, what are things that you should do, what are things that you shouldn't do. Do not keep insisting for example, all your life that you have absolute control over your children. So this is a very real thing. Unfortunately, when we do marriage prep calls, sometimes young couples got a lot of problem with parents, right? Because, you know, parents decide a lot of things. But I always think that when your child is of age, it is very difficult to draw the line what exactly of age means. Uh, typically, people talk about 21, 22. I mean, you can be 50 years old and still act as if you are 5 years old, right? But assuming that when you hit 21, uh, my general idea is that the child is of age and therefore the person is an adult. So as parents, you shouldn't keep trying to control your kid's life all the way until the fellow is 51, you know? doesn't make any sense. So you need to understand that there may be a time for you to let go, to respect the decision made by your own children. And so these are all biblical principles at play. Now, if you go back to the example of Abraham and Lot, so Abraham chose a land that was really uh, terrible and Lot chose the fertile land. But in the end, Abraham was the one who 
got blessed rather than Lot. And Lot got sucked into the problem of Sodom and Gomorrah. So therefore, always remember that whatever it, the case may be, you must be on God's side. Whether it's culture, whatever you do in your life, you choose the way that God would want you to choose and he will be with you. So the question is not your choice. The question is whether God is with the choice that you have made. And Ronald Reagan famously said, the question is not whether God is with us. The question is whether we are with God. It's a subtle difference, but the, the, the play of words really indicate that this man has thought about it a little bit deeper than most people. So with that, we will move on uh, from Genesis 13. And then Genesis 14 is a, a account of how Abraham went to rescue Lot. So Lot went on his way. And one of the first trouble that happened is that he got involved in all this kind of a local warfare and Abraham went in to rescue him. I don't want to spend too much time with that. But remember in previous preaching, that demonstrated that Abraham was not a weakling, right? He was a serious warrior. He was able to get his own family servants, go out there and really routed all the local warlords able to rescue Lot. So he, he was really not a, a, such a simple person after all. Now we reach Genesis 15, which was the recording of the covenant that God has made with Abraham, the first physical covenant that God has made with him. Let's come to God in a word of prayer and prepare our heart. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, that we are now at Genesis 15. We do pray that you grant us a heart that is open and humble before you, so that when we listen to your word, we will hear you and we will also be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. We know that we need to be humble because we, the Bible tells us you oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's jump into it, Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elysia of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Now remember that this was a case after Abraham had, uh, and Lot had separated, and then Lot got captured by all these warlords, uh, local kings, and Abraham went in for the, a, a very brave battle, rescued him, and, and then the Bible opened by saying, Fear not. This is a, a line that was intriguing to many Bible scholars. So people were asking, what, what was Abraham fearing? Was it because he saw God in a vision, therefore God said, fear not? Now, one of the things that people don't quite know is that every time an angel appears in the Bible, oftentimes the first thing the angel will say is, do not be afraid. So a lot of people think that, oh, angels are angelic. Or angelic means very pretty, very cute, very... Babies, you know, they are angelics. So actually, last week's evening, I asked Dr. Tong because I was going to prepare the sermon, right? So I said, do you think that angels are necessarily pretty? Can they be horrifying looking? That's why every time they appear, they say, fear not, because it's very frightening, kind of thing, isn't it? It's, it's like you, you marry someone and then she's very pretty, but in the morning, no makeup, right? So you <laughs> fear not. <laughs> then she said, fear not, it's I, do not be afraid. It's just that no makeup. So you know, can, can that be, be? Then Dr. Tong said, gee, I never thought about it that way. You know? <laughs> so I'm quite happy that I've given him something to think about. You know? <laughs> so, so what was Abraham afraid of? I think most people think, and of course from the subsequent verses also, we think that Abraham began to have fear and kind of doubts in his heart because you know, from the subsequent verses, you, you can see that he already started to think, hey, nothing is happening. You, you say that I'm going to have so many people in my household, but now I don't even have a son, right? So, so my, based on our custom, my servant, this, this guy will take care of my household. He will like take over everything, okay? He will be my heir. Therefore, we do believe that Abraham was afraid, not because he saw God in a vision, but because he thought that maybe this thing about promises of God and all that kind of thing maybe has some issue. 
And we, starting from Genesis chapter 12, when we first read about Abraham and the call of Abraham, this incident plus all the subsequent incidents give us an important lesson. Number one, that all biblical heroes are flawed. Have you noticed this, that in the Bible, all, almost all the heroes are recorded to have flaws. And some of them have really huge flaws, right? The biggest would, would be David, who committed what? Adultery and murder. So two big things that were quite terrible, and he actually committed both. There are only two persons in the Bible that did not have any flaws recorded in their life. Who knows who they are? No, no, you know, yeah, okay, like, you know, sir. Daniel and Joseph, yeah, two person. Daniel and Joseph, well, this congregation quite smart. Huh? Other, other church, when they say that, everybody, I don't know what. <laughs> Joseph and Daniel, two persons were, doesn't mean that they have no flaws, just that the Bible did not record any flaws in their life. Other than that, they are all flawed. So this is a very important aspect of our Reformed faith, which I keep emphasizing. We call this a total depravity of man. That while we have all these very nice words on Abraham in the New Testament, that he was called the friend of God, Abraham was also known as the father of all who have faith. And of course, uh, we lift him up as the, the one who is considered most faithful, especially in the later verses, when especially you come to the sacrifice of Isaac and all this familiar story. But still, he had flaws because he was fearful. It was not like once he came out of Ur, he was like, wow, you know, I could like a superman in faith. So it's a very important aspect of our teaching. Therefore, in our tradition, in the reform understanding, we do not put emphasis on the individual per se. And so that translates to a lot of practices in our faith. For example, title. We have at best a title reverend. That's about it. You know, we don't have anything beyond that. In other church traditions, beyond the reverend, they got a lot of titles. The very reverend, the most reverend, the, the right reverend. I don't know whether it's the wrong reverend. The right reverend, the canon doctor, the bishop, the archbishop, Monsignor, a lot of titles. So the, the bigger your title is, the holier you sort of become. Uh, in Reformed tradition, that is not the case. This is not to say that we shouldn't have any heroes in our life. And I think that while it's true that we are all totally fallen, remember in one of the preaching, I talk about how God is always looking for a few good men and good women. And so would you be that person who is exemplary to your children, to the community, to the church, because the world really need people like that? You read the Bible and all that, yeah, it's interesting, Jesus Christ is a perfect model and what have you. But it's quite different to then see someone who exemplifies the life of Jesus Christ and is a good example to us all. And I think the world needs that. At the same time, remember always, because of the total depravity of man, do not place excessive hope on people because we are all sinners. And if you do, you can be quite disappointed if you discover more of someone's life. For example, as a pastor, I know that uh, you guys are very kind, always say kind things about me. Blah, 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 blah. If I, God allowed me to open my mind and show my mind to you, you would throw stones at me and throw eggs or whatever it is. Or you get very disappointed. How can this person be like that? But because we are all sinners. So do not place excessive hope on anyone. I think that some people are inspiring and it is good to be inspired and I think it is good to be the person who can inspire other people's life but always be very careful and at the same time do not be overly surprised or discouraged at your own failures in your own walk in faith because even the best among us like Abraham would have times where he was fearful and the best among us among church leaders or among the leaders in our society who have a dark side or side of their life where they do not meet up to the so-called expectations of what we think the Bible would want us to have. So it's like, again very paradoxical and a, a, a bit odd kind of a situation, right? On the one hand, you do not want to place overemphasis on human being. On the other hand, it is, remains true that 
a living human being who exemplify very close to the ideals of God it would be most inspiring. For example, I, we have heard from Dr. Tan Lai Yong, uh, and in the parliament, one of the members of parliament gave Dr. Tan Lai Yong a title, call him the walking saint of Singapore, you know, because this good friend of mine, he has been a missionary in Yunnan for so many years, came back to Singapore because his children are all grown. First thing he did was he went to work among the Bangladesh foreign workers. And he, he's such a good thinker, right? He, he thought through it. The Bangladeshi uh, foreign worker, he wanted to befriend them. What do you do? Do you ask them to come and play badminton? Because, you know, we, we're all badminton players. He realized the Bangladesh people don't do that. What do they do? They do cricket. Who knows how to play cricket? Don't have right? I don't know. I don't understand. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You're from the region. Cricket. I'm completely confused, right? What a test score. I don't know what. You know, the score are all in the hundreds. How does that work? So what Dr. Tan did was he know that ACS have all this cricket thing. He went to ACS and said, all your used equipment, all that, give it to me. And so they donated the used equipment. And he went to learn to play cricket. You know, I take my hands off him and I say, man, you know, I would not have thought so far down the road. Okay, fine, I can care for foreign workers and all that. I may do something, but good chance I will ask him to kind of play ping pong or something because that's what I do. And Dr. Tan think one step further, much further. But I'm going to share something with you that may shock you, right? I was discussing him with him about theology of work. I, don't know, I must ask him for permission later. I may edit it out from the video. So I, I talk about theology of work, how an enterprise is calling itself a Christian enterprise. What does that mean? Dr. Tan say, oh, okay, there are two sides of the coin, blah, 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 dee, 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 dee. And then he asked me a question. He said, do you know why I do not put a bumper sticker on my car that says Jesus is Lord? You know, Dr. Tan asking me, why you put a bumper sticker? Because we are discussing Christian identity, right? He said, yeah, come to think of it, why not? He said, because when I send my son to the school every morning, sometimes some people will cut me, right? Cut my car, very rude. I want to show them the middle finger. And I said, huh? I thought you were walking saint of Singapore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> If I put a bumper sticker, Jesus is Lord, then I cannot do that, man, you know. So his point is that there are times where we need some privacy to be a bad guy kind of thing. Just scratching my head. I thought you were walking saint of Singapore. <laughs> so we are very close. So we're very open to each other in our discussion. But really, do not be surprised that there are among us people who are a little bit on the darker side because we're all sinners. But more importantly, do not surprise that in your walk of life, there will be times where you fall. And when you fall, the key is you must get up. And do not listen to the soft prompting of the devil, not of the Holy Spirit. Because remember, the devil is always around you. You know, in, in these previous past few years, I began to be a lot more sensitive to this issue. In the reform circle, we don't talk about the devil so much because we are very intellectual people. But it's absolutely true. That the Bible tells us that the devil prowls around like a what? Roaring lion, always looking for people to devour. And the, the devil's trick is, is always there. And I say to all couples who are going to get married that you must be careful because the devil is not happy that the people of God is happy. And that's what God wants us to be. And the devil will always be prompting and, and speaking quietly beside you. I found this picture when I was looking for devil whispering. Guy tattooed the devil whispering behind his ear. I don't know what that means. I mean, forever and ever the devil is whispering in his life. It's quite well done, right? I mean, artistically speaking, it's like the devil is whispering in his ear. I, I hope it's a reminder for him. But I tell you, it's very hard to remove okay, this giant kind of tattoo. After he become a Christian, I don't know how he's going to remove this. Maybe get somebody to change it to the angel or something <laughs> <laughs> whispering in your, in your ear. But it's a good reminder that when you fall, the devil will come and whisper in your ear and say, hey, come on, you know, this Christian thing, come on, you won't work. Look, you try so hard, you know, you still don't make it. It's just for, forever. Forget it, man. Why don't you just be with your friends and whatever, you know, or, or if you, if I fall, you say, look here, look here, you know, this stupid guy that you think is your great pastor or whatever, he fallen and what have you. So this faith is nothing. These are all work of the devil. And remember always that if Abraham could be a bit fearful, uh, so can you, because we are all fallen people. And what the Lord said with him is in verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, to Abraham, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, 
once again look towards the heaven and numbers of the stars if you are able to number them then he said to him so shall your offspring be and here comes the next verse that is considered a very crucial verse in Genesis 15 verse 6 and he believed the Lord and he which is the Lord counted it to him as righteousness in our reform tradition we always use capital letter when uh, the word he appear referring to God and this is a very important verse because this is a verse that has been referred to by the New Testament writers many many times the Apostle Paul for example wrote in Romans 4 3 for what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness again in Galatians 3 6 just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, this is an important verse because for those of us who are here because we believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, it's very clear and very simple because we believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for us. We cast our, he bore our sins for us, resurrected on the third day, victory over death, and we believe. And so we are justified and we're made righteous. But for someone like Abraham who have not met Jesus Christ, how would he then be able to achieve that righteousness? And the Apostle Paul explained about the principle behind being made right and he used Abraham as an example because Genesis 15 already noted this. Remember when Paul wrote this, Genesis 15 verse 6 already existed. And he believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. So for Christians, we are quite familiar with all these verses. After a while, it's like, okay, fine, he believed in God. What does that mean? I want you to think a little bit further, at least into two areas. Number one, whom did Abraham believe? What does it mean to say Abraham believed? The Bible simply says Abraham believed the Lord. In the original language, it means Abraham believed God. It's uh, Jehovah, Yahweh. Abraham believed God. And you know, that seems quite simple, right? To believe God. You go around asking people, do you believe God? Everybody said, yeah, I sort of believe God. I mean, the most classic example is Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself. Uh, he's a very pragmatic guy all his life. So when asked whether he believed God, he he will take the middle ground. Or he sort of say that, uh, yeah, I, I sort of believe that there's a God, but I may not believe in any type of God or who that God is. I thought it's quite clever. Just in case there's a God, at least you can say that. I, I did say I believe in you. You know, <laughs> I, I met another guy who said this. Oh, I believe God, but I do not believe there's a vessel to God. Oh, that's a little bit more sophisticated. That means I believe God, but I don't believe that anyone can claim that he has a vessel towards God. So when we read the word believe God, we sort of think that maybe it's kind of a warm and fuzzy feeling in our heart. Do you believe? Yeah, I kind of uh, believe. And or maybe I just believe whatever you say. I say I just believe or whatever. Uh, but I must tell you this morning that the belief that Abraham had was not a blind faith that was directed at nothing. It was not simply, okay, fine, you tell me to believe, I believe. It was not. We in the previous preaching, we talked about how Abraham is considered the father of monotheism, the guy who, who really think that there is only one God, even when he was a child. So Abraham actually knew well the attributes of God or who God is and believed. So when we say Abraham believed in God, we know that Abraham believed in who God really is and put the faith on the God who has all the attributes that we are very, very familiar with today. Now, why am I putting emphasis on this? Because your understanding of God, or in a theological term, doctrine of God, is extremely important. I think one of the most famous quotations of Dr. Stephen Tong going down the road will be this. Much of our failures in life stem from our failure in understanding the doctrine of God. Now, this is a... a, a Looks simple, uh, but it is actually a very profound statement. Dr. Tong proposed that all the problems you have in life, and by the way, all the problems the world have, from communism to whatever ism, modernism, whatever ism there is, all stem from one root, and the root is doctrine of God. That because you understand God differently, so everything changed. The first 
domino was placed in the wrong place. So you tuck, ta 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 everything go wrong. One of the things that the illustration that Dr. Tong has that's quite interesting is if you say that the truth is in this direction, from step one, you deviate a little bit off from the truth. The harder you work, the faster you go, the further you will be away from the truth. And I thought, wow, that's quite brilliant. Huh? This guy must be really strange when he was a kid, always thinking about strange things. Little bit out. The faster you, the harder you work, the more fervent you become, you are actually further away from the truth. Because at the first step, at the first principle, you got it wrong. And so when you get your doctrine of God wrong, everything is wrong. Abraham's faith in God was not blind because he knew who God is. What is blind faith? There are many blind faiths in the world today. One of the incidents that the newspaper uh, reported was a bunch of Singaporean students went to do all this exchange program in a neighboring country. And so when they were in a neighboring country, they witnessed something that really shook them until the problem recovering. On the open street, they saw a person who is supposed to be a much lower social status based on their religious faith, who walked by someone who is of higher social status. And the shadow of that lower status guy touched the first person. And this guy went berserk and said that you, you, have, you have stained me, you have disgraced me because your shadow touched me and you are a much lower class of a person than I am. And he agitated the people of the village to go attack this young person of a lower status group. And so the Singaporean student also saw it, secondary school, and they were like shell-shocked. They don't know what to do. What, how do you think of this? Now, the interesting thing is that I was following this story, and BBC had a reporting on it. They sent a journalist down to the village to interview the family of the young man that got bitten. And I was listening to it. The young man's mother said, look here, in our faith, we belong to this miserable group by destiny. And I believe. The mother said that. The journalist said, hey, you know, how can you do this? You know, you, you should stand up for justice and blah, blah, blah. And the mother said, no, we belong to, we are born like that. This is our destiny. I believe. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Do you say that the mother had faith? Yes, yeah, she had faith. But what sort of faith did she have when she said, I believe? She had a faith. Is it blind? It's not entirely blind, but she accepted fatalism, meaning that's the way it is. Now, when we come to the Reformed faith, we have flavors of that too, right? We talk about the sovereignty of God, how God is in control. And later on, I'm going to touch a little bit more on that. What difference is there between them and us? Isn't it true that when we say Abraham believed, Abraham simply believed, and you say, oh, he counted to him as righteousness. The difference is exactly in the top statement. To whom did Abraham believe? Abraham did not believe in fatalism. Uh, come what may, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, because he understood who God is. And thanks be to God that the Reformed faith has a deep, deep understanding of this. And I've shown you this before. I'm going to show you again and again and again and again because I keep going back to it myself. The Westminster Confession of Faith, our statement of faith in the Reformed faith, has a tremendously powerful and intriguing chapter and chapters relating to all aspects of life, particularly chapter 2 of God and the Holy Trinity. And what happened is that early church fathers spent five years of their life gathering together, debating, coming up with this understanding. What does the Bible say about God? What, what are some of the summary statements? And then the Westminster Confession of Faith is a result. Relating to God, if you ask the question, what kind of God did Abraham believe in? The Westminster say in chapter 2, section 1, there is one only living God and true God who is infinite in being and perfection. It is a lot of words. I'm sure you cannot see it unless you've got bionic eyes. So many, many things. And I tell you, every single one of these things would take many sermons to really drill into it. And, and that's the kind of... God, the attributes of God that we believe in. I'm going to highlight some of them, right? For example, Almighty. Almighty, you know, that means he can do anything he wants. Almighty God. 
most wise. And the word most appears many times in this. Most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, most loving, most gracious, most merciful, abundant in goodness and truth. Every single one of these would be an attribute that we can spend our entire life understanding. So my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you say you believe in God, <laughs> I think that most of us, including me, we, we don't quite get it. We, we think that, okay, yeah, yeah, we, so we believe in God. Just one of them alone, I think, will flow us. Most wise. Do you know of anyone who is most wise? Most wise. What does that mean, even? That means he cannot, the words I always use, uh, possibly make a mistake. Can you imagine that? I mean, I, I preached that to you before. Right? Till now, it's still something that I cannot wrap my mind around. No? Cannot possibly make a mistake. How can that be? You know anybody who cannot possibly make a mistake? Cannot be right. I mean, in life, so many people, even the, the best among us. I have the, 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 the nice opportunities these few years to meet with very brilliant people all over. Some are really big tycoon in businesses. And you know, you, you, <laughs> there are two types. Uh. Some people make money the old-fashioned way. They inherited it. <laughs> that one's not very interesting if you inherit it. At least you don't lose it. Uh. But some forge from nothingness, right? That's the kind of thing. And I, I'm very appreciative of that. I was an entrepreneur for more than 10 years, you know. But I was a serial entrepreneur. Well, try this, cannot work. Try that, cannot work. Try that, cannot work. Long time cannot work. Uh. That's why I'm standing here. <laughs> <laughs> so I have appreciative for people who forge from nothing, including the Cha Kui Tiao man. You think it's very easy? You go and chala, try to stand out there early morning. Cha, 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 cha. Those that have long queues, la, no queue one, not interesting. Uh, super long queue one. Maybe they hire people to queue, I don't know. <laughs> And as an entrepreneur, nobody, whether you are brilliant in entrepreneurship or brilliant academician or professor, or that, none of you would dare to claim that you are most wise or, or even, even the word wise. Don't forget about what most are, just wise. Right? And so can you wrap your mind around a being that is like cannot possibly make a mistake? I, I say no, you can't. But when you come to a closer understanding that God cannot possibly make a mistake and your doctrine of God is along that line, I tell you the implications are many, you know. That no matter what happened in your life, you are believing that this God who allowed this to happen cannot make a mistake. So therefore, I'm at peace because I believe. You know what I'm saying? It is not just simply, oh yeah, sure, I believe in God. Not so simple. And I pray that spiritually as we move in our life, you get a closer and closer understanding of some of the key attributes of God. This is the God that Abraham believed in. He believed, he knew. So this is why it's not a blind faith. Because we are not saying whatever, la, you know, we, like die, die, everything, we, we just die, we just get bullied, we, the injustice in the world, that's the way it is. No, we absolutely believe that God is most loving, most gracious, most merciful, most holy, most free, most wise, and most whatever it is. And we know from scripture that justice is important. If it is not done now, in due time, God will bring it to be. That is the key difference between our understanding of God in control and a blind and fatalistic faith. So, God, Abraham believed in a God like this. Second, what did Abraham actually believe in when you say he believed in the Lord? It doesn't mean that he believed in the existence of God. No. The Bible tells us that Abraham believed in the promises of God and the promises of are many, right? But for Abraham, it was focused on a couple of things. The promise that God is going to raise up a multitude of his own people through Abraham. That is why Abraham is known as the father of all who have faith. It's not just about being the Jews alone. We all know by now. Now, in the times of Abraham, can you imagine if you were Abraham you, you, and God said that through my people, you know, a lot of children, all of you. It's not just about having many people who is called young because surname young, or as many youngs as you can in the world. No. Abraham knew, although not entirely clear, that God through his family is going to raise up people that will demonstrate the way of the Lord. Genesis 18 tells us that. That most importantly, now for people like us, we know that through the lineage of Abraham would then come Jesus Christ, through whom God would redeem his people. This is very clear in the Bible and is a consistent message. And again, 
this is why Abraham is known as the father of us all, all of us. And so there's a campfire song. Father Abraham has seven children. Seven children has Father Abraham. It's the right song, you know, Father Abraham of us all. But of course, that's only by lineage. And the Bible consistently gives us this understanding. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, first book of the New Testament, already listed. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, immediately followed by the son of Abraham. Of course, it's only from the physical lineage kind of idea. But that doesn't mean that Jesus is the son of Abraham. You, you know what I mean. But truly, physically, through that lineage, through Abraham, then salvation came to the whole world. And, you know, but from Abraham's standpoint, it was still something that is difficult to understand. So Abraham then asked the question, how am I supposed to know all these things? And Look how gracious God is here in verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who bring you out, brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And Abraham asked, Oh Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And again, here you see a trait of Abraham, the father of all who have faith, who did not say, Okay, fine, since you say so, amen, that's it. No, he asked question. He said, How? And earlier we already talked about how to be assured that, you know, in our world of life, we will fall, we will have times where we will doubt, we will fear. But here's a good demonstration. Not only that, this guy asked honest question from a honest heart. And I want to tell you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning, that God honors people who ask honest questions. So I said earlier that do not be surprised in your walk of life where there are times when you fall, right? At the same time, do not feel overly concerned if you have honest questions. I think God looks into your heart and, and wants that honest question. And you should ask. You should, you should ask God, why, why is this the case? Why is this? I don't understand this. Because, of course, God reads your heart as well. I think that's a very important thing for us to all know that God honors it. And I think one of the best examples has been preached before is in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Remember there's a father who had a son who was demon possessed by the demon and then he came to look for the apostles and uh, disciples and asked them to, to exorcise the demon and they all tried, tried and then nothing happened. So then he came to Jesus Christ and said, hey, you know, your, your kake are all useless huh? because we try to get them it cannot happen. So can you help? And then he, he said the wrong thing. He told Jesus Christ, if you can, if you can, can you please deliver my son from this demon? And Jesus said, if? Why do you say if? With, with God, everything is possible. You, you're using the wrong word. You use if. Do, if you believe, it will be done of you. And what did the Father say? 9.24 I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, I am very, very thankful to this verse because this is the verse that I say often to God. So, you know, I believe, but you know, la, I'm a bit difficult. La, you know. <laughs> can, you, can you help my unbelief? And I'm very thankful that Jesus Christ did not say, hey, wake up, la, come on, you know. You know who you're talking to or not. Huh? You better go to a seminary and ch the Chinese use the word, mian pi si guo, go face the wall and go and uh, repent first before you come back to me. No! Bible says Jesus immediately healed the son, right? So Jesus accommodated, he understand. So he understand where we have honest question, honest difficulty in believing, and he will accommodate it. So I say you do that as well. In my ministry, I actually hate people who pretend. By the way, I tell you, Jesus Christ hates that the most. Hypocrisy is the one thing that he's really, really upset about. I would rather you come to me and tell me that, you know, I don't believe, like, this is very difficult, this is terrible. This is, you know. So I am friends to a lot of such people in my life. Like, for example, this lawyer guy who's a alcoholic. He finished seminary, you know, by the way. He has finished the seminary. But, you know, because he has a dysfunctional background and what have you, so very tough and nobody likes to talk to him in church because he always smells of alcohol and all that. And I'm like the only guy who will have lunch with him. But I'm the only one eating because he's always drinking somehow. He has this small little bottle made of tin. You know. So when he thinks I'm not looking, he would, he would keep it again. Kind of thing. But I... I 
I think it's fine that he's very honest with his feelings and honest with how he feel. He curse and swear at our system and what have you. I think he's honest. Much better, I think, than someone who pretend to be part of the deal, but you know, at the end of the day, they don't quite believe. Remember this. Abraham asked God, how would I know? And like Jesus Christ to the father of the boy who was possessed, God went the extra mile with Abraham. And so Genesis 15, 8, 9, 10 and 11 contain a covenant ritual that would sound more strange in today's term. So you have read through the Bible just now in your second responsive reading. God said to Abraham, bring me a heifer three-year-old, a, 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 a little cow three-year-old, a goat, female goat three-year-old, a ram three-year-old, da, 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 young pigeon. And Abraham brought all this to him. And the illustration, uh, there are quite a few illustrations on the internet you can find. And then the, the animals were cut into half and put into two different places. Now this is a ritual that the true meaning of which cannot be truly found today. And a lot of Bible scholars try to find uh, explanation and say, oh, the cow represent this, the lamb represent that. And uh, there's a verse, uh, verse 11, when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So some Bible scholars say, oh, that in your life the devil will come, so you must drive them away. But there are actually no biblical confirmation of all these theories. So I, I don't want to spend time telling you that this represents this and that because really there, there aren't many things to say except that this was a kind of treaty that was familiar to certainly Abraham and the people of his time. And there are a few things that we know for sure. The fire would represent the Lord and the smoking pot. So finally what happened is that Abraham went into a deep sleep, right? The Bible says and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13, um, and the Lord then gave Abraham a prediction or prophecy of what will happen to the people of Israel. They're going to be captured by the Egyptians, although he didn't use the word Egyptians. And verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed through these pieces. So dead animals cut the two, line up, fire passed through with a smoking pot. So from the other Old Testament passages, you can be quite certain to know that the smoking pot will represent the nation of Israel because it's a covenant between two parties. Ma. And then the fire torch, of course, from Exodus, we know the flaming fire always represented God. So God and Israel make the covenant together to this. So we know that that is a rite that was done for parties uh, back in the ancient days. They make the covenant. What will happen is that they will pass through these two animals that have been slaughtered. And the idea is that if the two of us make this covenant, if any party breaks the covenant, then that party will end up like the animals that got cut into two. So that we all know. But what are the individual animals represent? We don't know. So it's a very severe form of saying that I'm going to have a promise made from you. If we break the promise, uh, it's a bit like Chinese, right? Always when we want to swear, we will call heaven, call earth, call thunder, call don't know what. 天打雷劈不得好死啊,出去给罗力撞死, you know, that kind of thing. We, we, we do things like that. So the covenant has that flavor inside there. But I want you to know something. Abraham did not pass through the animals himself because he went into a deep sleep. Only the flaming torch and the smoking pot did. So therefore, in this particular covenant, the symbolism is there, but only actually one party did it. It was actually a one-sided affair. It was not like Abraham proposed a covenant. It was God telling Abraham, this is going to happen, you're going to do this, I'm going to do this. Now, in law, I know there are lawyers among us, I want to be very careful with my word. This is called a suzerainty kind of a treaty or a covenant. A suzerainty treaty is a treaty between two unequal parties and it was completely built upon the more powerful party. So in this case, it was upon God, the most powerful party. Abraham and humanity, you know, nothing much. The lesser party's job is very simple. You need to simply obey. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, such is the covenant God had with Abraham and such is the salvation given to us all. In Reformed Evangelical Understanding, we are talking about the sovereignty of the Almighty God. To put it in a nutshell, you and I are saved 
because God decided to save us on his own. It's a one-sided affair. And this salvation is not something that God suddenly thinks, hey, I'm going to do this suddenly. But it's a part of the overarching macro beginning to the end, from everlasting to everlasting plan of God. This is Reformed Evangelical Understanding. We believe that the Bible consistently tells us that God has made up in His mind, even before Adam and Eve was formed, the entire salvation plan. And we know that because not only the covenant of Abraham shows us that, the entire Bible shows us that. So in the focal reading today, we read from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 10. And it contains one of the most profound descriptions of this one-sided love affair, if you may, of God. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God, our Lord, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual being blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the covenant that God made with Abraham seemed to be in a surface reading, oh, you know, something that happened in history. Not so simple. It's actually a part of God's eternal plan to signify that He has made a covenant with the Father of all who have faith, and all of us are inclusive. And that salvation is upon us. The Apostle Paul extends the revelation even further that because of who God is it cannot be something that God only think of the last moment or suddenly okay like maybe I have a covenant with Abraham no it was something that happened even before the foundation of the world in reformed evangelical understanding if you sit here this morning and you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you are a true Christian true and true you have been chosen before the world was even formed. It is not something which anyone, I think, can really wrap our mind around easily. But this is the word of God. And you see the consistent link all throughout, right? From Genesis. Although that's why we study Genesis, not like some old ancient books. It's part of the revelation of the plan of God. I tell you, if you tell me that the Bible is is written by some people who gather together and conspire. This is the most brilliant conspiracy in the ever, 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 because the consistency is just crazy. From Abraham till now, we sit here. We are part of the covenant that God has revealed to Abraham, and so it's relevant to us. So this is our understanding. Therefore, a Reformed Evangelical Christian is a person who understands that for whatever the reason, he or she is special. He is picked by God for whatever the reason. I keep saying that because I don't know the reason. And therefore, we have a different calling of life. We are serious about our faith because it's not something that we have done, you know. We, we are special people. It doesn't mean we'll, we'll be proud, we'll be arrogant, but it does mean that we have a very serious understanding of mission, my purpose. What, what am I doing here? This as opposed to many of the newer movement out there, right? Where people think that you chose God. So I tell you about God like an insurance salesman keeps telling you, hey, believe in God, very good. You know, wow, you know, next time you die, you go to heaven. Uh, very good. Uh, then, you know, and especially these days, so I believe God, you, everything pao jiao, and your business become good and what have you. Tell me, yeah, sounds good. Lah. The worst is Rick Warren. Rick Warren say that, oh, I figured out for myself already. If I believe God, huh? And God exists. Wow, one day I'll open my eyes after I die. I'll be in heaven, okay? Wow. If I believe God and God does not exist, then no problem, you know. So both ways I win, right? So, okay, please believe God is a good idea. I say, what? <laughs> the, the kind of thinking, you know. And, you know, so we understand the Bible for what it says, and thanks be to God, it should then bring to us this tremendous sense of purpose in life and should change our life it, 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 like I always use the words the things that make you happy the things that make you sad should all change 
But I must say that it's, 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 it can be a very difficult because those people who just preach the utilitarian faith gospel, they are very popular and, and the whole world is moving towards the direction, right? Fulfilling what Jesus Christ would say, few will find a way. It's a narrow gate, narrow way. That's another story, but, but it really is fulfilling that. And I think one of the flip side for me is that it gets very painful sometimes to listen to some of these people. On Thursday, I was invited to a lunch gathering as an observer. So they, they wanted to talk about theology of work and all that. So they invited this CEO of one of the biggest, biggest companies in Singapore to, to preach. The guy is from one of those mega church fellow to share about Christianity and work. Why, why is it so important? And all that. It was just a small group of people, but they got free lunch. Right? So I went. So I said, you know, and and the guy stood up and speak, and all that. He said, you know, believing in God is a, such a wonderful thing, you know, in business. You know, sometimes you go into a boardroom and you don't know what's going to happen and, and the, the going very tough. So what, you know what I do? I pray, man. I pray. I pray that God will change the mind of whoever, 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 so that we, uh, you know, our business deal will, will go right. And then after that, he said, but you know something? You really don't know who will come into the meeting, right? In the ballroom, there's so many people. Some people are Christian, some people are not. So you know what I do? I will always arrive early. I will bless every single chair so that no matter who sit in it, ah, bless already. So the meeting, I tell you, I testify that oftentimes the meeting go my way because I go and bless every single chair. You know how difficult it is for me to sit down there and keep quiet, you know? So I, I tell you a secret, you see me do this, it means I'm biting my hand, no? so that I don't open my mouth and say, excuse me, you know, <laughs> can I say something? <laughs> so my hand has a permanent imprint here. I talk to a lot of you, I have to do this. Because <laughs> and he's, like, he's a very successful CEO and he, he, he's invite, he was invited because you know, they, they think that he's a Christian leader. And I bless every chair. And it's sort of saying I get a saikong in and do a chant and, you know, and the thing will go my way. And, you know, on the surface then, if you think that you choose God, then yeah, sure, you, you are in charge. Ma. You bless every chair. You go and you are the supernatural whatever. It's, can you identify how similar this with all the common faith that we have in the world? <laughs> get a charm, get a talisman, stick a Bible verse behind, below any, every chair. <laughs> be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you, or something like that. Stick below, <laughs> and it, it should work, right? And have you heard of this testimony? Soldiers in the war, then somebody shoot him, cannot block by the Gideon Bible. Wow. So the Bible blocked it. Guarantee you the Muslim will say Quran also block la Buddhist also got scripture or whatever, Hindu got their whatever. Some of the scripture much thicker than the Bible, okay? So come on, you know. So the reformed evangelical faith understand things much, much deeper level. Most importantly, we understand it in the biblical manner. From the perspective of understanding Abraham and the covenant, God made a covenant with Abraham, not meant for him alone but for all generations to come, that if we're going to walk through these two animals that have been cut up, whichever party will break the covenant will be like the animals. Cut, broken into two pieces. And guess who broke the covenant? We did. We broke the covenant. And who paid the price? Jesus Christ did. This was why Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. Can you see the consistency from Genesis all the way till today, till the day where we observe Holy Communion, we are reminded, this is my body broken for you from the covenant all the way from the time of Abraham, just as animals will be broken into two, because we broke the covenant, God's body was broken for us. My dear, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray that through the series of preaching, you don't get a warm and fuzzy feeling and, and go off just like that. I want to tell you with all my heart that if you are a Christian, you are not a nobody. It cannot be. 
God cannot be picking a nobody before the foundation of the world. I know that life likes to tell us that we are nothing, especially those of us who have many struggles in life and difficulties. Sometimes it got to do with our family. Some parents, you know, like to tell you that you are nothing. Sometimes it's cultural trait, right? Tough cultural trait again. My mother used to look at us siblings and say, the dog is better than you. How can it be? The dog got so many fleas and everything. How can it be better than me? And we were tough people, so we grew up listening to that. So quite okay. Lah. Today, you go to tell your kid, dog is better than you. The fella grew up <laughs> psychotic, thanks to my mother. I become a serial killer because my mother said I'm worse than the dog. And <laughs> But the other day, your boss, right, life, right, come on, you know, the fact that you drive a car that is lousy, or you don't even have a car, your car, your left car and the right car, the car car kind of thing, that's all you have. Those who don't understand, Hokkien, ask your friends. <laughs> life tells you you are nobody. I tell you that if you are Christian, it, it cannot be because you are chosen before the foundation of the world. You are a person that God planned to redeem beyond even Abraham till before the world was even formed. The covenant of Abraham was just one step where God, in order to help Abraham understand that he was part of God's eternal plan. And so God used the richer that he understood to demonstrate this and also demonstrate to us all today that we are the one who broke the covenant because of that his body was broken like the animals split into two. But those are the things that we know. The focus we should have is that we are already redeemed. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, know that you are redeemed and God planned to redeem you even before the foundation of the world. Out of the billions and billions of people in the world, you have that privilege. Therefore, live a life worthy of that great grace that has been given to us. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for your word that has been preached. We know that in our life, there are so many voices all over, including that of the devil, always whispering in our ears, steering us left and right, so much so that we miss the big picture. And so many of us struggle in life over things that must surely be trivial in your sight. And yet it consumes us physically, emotionally, even spiritually. And so we spend all our life being sad and depressed and bitter and grumbling and moaning and groaning this is tough this is not happening the guy don't like me my family don't like me the world don't like me it's so many issues oh god help us to be liberated from it all jesus christ said we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free set us free from all these trivialities of life that weigh us down that we will return to your word and have a deep, deep appreciation that you have called us before the world was even formed. And that through historical acts that Abraham went through in the covenant, we see your grace again demonstrated to us, the biblical truth, that we have been rebellious people, and so the body of Jesus Christ was broken for us, just as the animals' bodies were broken in the covenantal act. We do pray, O oh God, that we're not going to dwell on our past. The Apostle Paul says we must forget the past and we must strain forward to the crown of the glory that can only be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Grants to us this understanding that we are not a nobody in life. Let us turn back to you all the time from whom the source of life and source of strength must come. May we be able to draw strength from you all our life long that we may live a life that will glorify you and by so doing be able to enjoy you forever. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.